Delighted to be back for the really hard work part of the day. So don't, don't fail me now, everybody. Let's carry on. Um, the room's cold to keep us awake, which I appreciate. But let's heat it up with a lot of, yeah, a lot of ideas and energy and smart things that we're going to talk about now. So here's what we're going to do. I know you took this challenge very seriously about having animated, lively report backs. Because if you didn't, I went into your group and reminded you vociferously that that's what we were expecting you to come back with. So people are starting to put flip charts up on the walls back there, and that's tremendous. And we encourage you to wander around and have a look. And if you see something you like, there are post-it notes, little, you know, whatever those are. Don't you wish you were the guy that invented those post-it notes? Uh, uh, there are post-it notes that Nate's handing out. Uh, and you can write some, handwrite something down. You can throw it up next to one of these things. If you don't see something that you think should be there, do so because we never throw these things away and they're part of the posterity of this project. So what we're going to do is I'm going to hear back from each of you what came out of these discussions and see if we start to get a distillation. Nate, once he finishes uh, distributing the ever important post-it notes, is going to live scribe for us uh, on the screen. So we'll try to get, we'll just, again, that's why I'm hoping that you're pithy, pithy, pithy in your reporting. Uh, and pithy, pithy reporting. Uh, and then we'll, so that we'll have something. But don't panic, you know, if something isn't perfectly worded. Remember our mantra from this morning, it's all about chill. Uh, speaking of chill, uh, because I know that the most important thing to placemakers is, a, is a, what we used to be able to call, we can't call it now in a multicultural society anymore, but we used to call it a Christian beverage. Um, did anybody else come from a family where, you were, where it was called a Christian beverage? Well, that's what you were allowed to do after 5 o'clock. And at, at 6 o'clock here, there's going to be a beverage waiting for you out there, uh, which is great. And then there are two receptions that are going on simultaneously, and most of you know where you're going, to the Museum of Vancouver or to a cool saloon in Yaletown. Uh, but you can stop here and have a drink with people that are gathered and then go your, to the uh, places that you have been um, assigned to. And uh, which is all based on capacity. And then, uh, and then you can go and have a, a nice meal in the town. So we've got uh, six groups to hear from. And then we've got two plenaries and then a final conclusion plenary. So it's a bit of a marathon. That's why the coffee's going to keep coming. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that uh, we go, I'm, we're not going to have any particular order on this. But I think we're going to start with place governance. So. Who can report to us in a scintillating way about place governance? Here he comes. Do you want to do it from there, or you can do it from the floor? Which would you prefer? A microphone can come to you, or you can come here. Good point, Ethan. Thank you for keeping your eye on the ball. If we want it on the live stream, you have to come to where this camera's pointing. That's why they pay you the big bucks. OK, go. Place governance. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We had a great conversation. Uh, I'm going to go through quickly some of the points, but we have about five pages worth of notes over there, both from our conversation and then folks who came up afterwards to, uh, to talk uh, and put some more notes on there. Fundamentally, we talked about who's in charge of a place and that ownership needs to be broader than just municipal government. Uh, we need some new tools, structures, and financing mechanisms to steward long-term transformation. Too often, the community is under the box, so to speak, and the government is sitting on top of the box. How can we unlock the natural creativity of the people uh, while the government is a partner uh, and leverage the government resources to work uh, to create space for, for place leadership? But that leadership really has to be more broadly shared. The problem with financing tools is that when you create a governance mechanism, the people supplying the money are the ones who control the decision making generally. And this is, uh, requires us to be more creative and think about some new kinds of, of tools. We talked a little bit about things like community benefit districts, which uh, might offer some, some opportunities. We need to address place governance efforts in, in key locations. So we need to have a sort of an infrastructure, uh, national or international infrastructure in the place uh, placemaking movement to support these kind of key 
locations that, are, that need place governance so that we can develop these models. They need intellectual support, research, communication support. We need to prove the model. We need some more exploration uh, of the issues of, of power, race, and control, which is something that a lot of people feel that we haven't really dug into enough here. Uh, we also need to have a long view. Lighter, quicker, cheaper doesn't work for place governance. Some of the challenges are that folks uh, brought up, just a few of them, you know, how do you work with uh, local unions? Can they become community partners and supporters of placemaking? How do you mitigate liability? How do you remove the barriers to experimentation? And kind of to wrap this up with a, a big thought, you know, placemaking started as a radical critique of the design professions, of planning, of the benign neglect of spaces by government. And we can't lose that, right? Placemaking was really a guerrilla activity, an informal activity. It's about taking power, not being given power. And it has to be, place governance has to be deeper than about creating playgrounds for the privileged. As my friend uh, Amir said about his work in India, placemaking can be used even as an excuse to regulate, re-regulate informal spaces that may already work or may work for uh, low-income people. And we're in danger of placemaking being appropriated uh, by the design professions. And over the last few years, as it becomes much more mainstream by agencies, uh, there's, there's a danger we're creating a new set of gatekeepers that are separating the people from what we're really trying to accomplish. And so we have to really guard against that now, uh, especially over the ne next few years. So thank you. So um, yeah, how do we get that on the screen? We, excuse me, sir? He's got it. He has got it. Thank you, sir. You're on the screen. Mind you, anybody over 30 can't read that font. Oh, can you read that font? Okay, not very well, yeah. Okay, so who's in charge of a place? This notion of community benefit districts. Um, I'm interested in this notion of needing international infrastructure. Isn't it interesting we're at that time where hyper-locals becoming super duper important and international is becoming super duper important. I'm not quite sure where it leaves the jurisdictions in the middle, but you can see at both levels that we've got the squeeze going on um, and that we need data to prove the model. Um, I want someone to, a wordsmith out there, if lighter, quicker, cheaper doesn't work for governance, what does? Say it again. It seeds governance. Okay, so, all right, so it seeds governance, it informs governance. Place, place led governance. Okay, I, okay, got it. Um, and this, all, this notion that was just suggested at the end there, that it started, that the roots of placemaking came from, in some ways, a vacuum, neglected space. Nobody was actually interested in it at, in, at, civic, at, at, at government levels, potentially, or at the corporate level, and now that is changing. So there's the risk. And we're, you hear that in all sorts of jurisdictions. What happens to you when you get mainstreamed? If placemaking is mainstreaming, if the developers are starting to talk about placemaking, which they all are, uh, what's happening to that? How do we make sure that this is still vibrant and community-led and outside? I was interested, you know, so many people you've said over the last few days that public and civic space is about con connecting with the other it's about outsiders having access in, and what happens if we get too mainstreamed? Um, so I think these are very important questions to be to put on the agenda for us to keep asking ourselves. Does anybody else in the governance gang want to say anything that did, was not related? I realize there was lots that wasn't, but is there a pithy point you want to add? A silo buster, a silo buster. absolutely. That it, it, this uh, Fred's signature, his email signature says. Um, oh, Nathan, you don't have to do everything. You really don't. You can sit here and live scribe. Somebody else will move a microphone. Come back, Nate, when you're ready. Thank you. Um, let's hear it for Nate Storing, who does everything. <laughs> 
So it breaks silos, and Fred on his email signature, if you've ever had an email from him, you know you'll see it says at the bottom, to get everything right, we've got to turn everything upside down. So that's, and that's happening in many, many domains. I bet people outside the placemaking world are saying the same thing. Public health is saying that. Lots and lots of folks are saying, let's look at the granular. Anything else on governance that you want to creatively call out like Fred just did? Okay, let's keep going. Um, how about transportation and streets as places? Who's reporting on that? Mr. Toth. Toth, excuse me. I better say it right because right, I've been saying them wrong all week. Remember, it rhymes with both, not cloth. Indeed. <laughs> Gary Toth. So we took a different tact with transportation. <clears throat> We've engaged the uh, Placemaking Leadership Council. Over the last couple of years, uh, we've created a Streets as Places definition web resource video. So we focus our attention, and also we created information on transit, which we call thinking beyond the station, and sort of the same thing. How do you use transportation to build communities instead of building transportation through communities? So our focus was more on how do we get to Streets as Places and thinking beyond the station. So we brainstormed on what it is that they would like the Placemaking Leadership Council Transportation to do next. And these were not in any particular order. I haven't gone through and sorted them. But one was aggravator. Aggregator of best practices. We could also be aggravating people to do the best practices. Um, how do we make the economic argument for placemaking in streets as places? And the reason is, is that more elected officials will listen if, in fact, it translates into helping them solve a problem, helps them raise money, it's a little more esoteric to say, I want to increase biking in my town. Lots of mayors get that, lots of elected officials get that, but many really need to have that economic argument. <clears throat> we need to better connect the research that's going on. There's a ton of research funded by the federal government and other levels in the actual practice. And I don't know if Rock Miller is still in the room somewhere. I don't see his, there he is couldn't pick out your mustache fast enough, Rock. But Rock was telling a story about how on consecutive weeks he sat in on a research summit and then he sat in and he's part of the folks that write the practice and it was like, don't you guys ever talk to each other? I mean, this stuff has been going on for 20 years. So we need to better connect them. We then need to create, better support a community of practice that has been kind of initiated with the Placemaking Leadership Council Transportation one way would be to create a directory of subject matter experts with their expertise and contact inf info. And by the way, let me pause and say that we're trying to do this in a lighter, quicker, cheaper way because to sort of implement all of this, we, we don't have a million dollars, right? And so what we're trying to do is link all of our partners with resources and tease a lot of that stuff out of there. And one way would be, I mean, there's folks, for instance, in Sandpoint, Idaho, that have a particular expertise on how to apply form-based code for placemaking in a small town. So let's create a directory with Aaron Qual's name in there in that little thing and, and what his expertise is, and then sort of fill in this directory so that people who are part of the Placemaking Leadership Council could say, oh, if I have a question on that, I, I can go talk to Aaron and vice versa. Uh, we, the folks said that, I mean, there's a lot of advocates, zealous nuts, as we like to say, that are constantly out there trying to make an argument that people on the Placemaking Leadership Council, PPS, and Smart Growth America, and all these other folks, we can't be everywhere, they can't afford to pay us all the time. So how can we provide resources for them to make arguments? For instance, how about a library of PowerPoints? Some, somebody in the room, Joan is here somewhere, is going to talk about transportation and streets as places on Monday, and she asked me for some slides. Well, what if we formalized that and had to sort of library a bank of, of templates for various things. Photos, webinars, um, how about if we, you know, there's all sorts of organizations doing cool webinars. How about if we sort of synthesize them and curate them? One page briefing sheets on particular topics and Federal Highway Administration is doing a great job on that right now. You know, one, a page on myths about why or when you can use um, funding for bicycle projects. Case studies and um, Again, this would be crowdsourced. It would cost way too much money to try to get a grant and have somebody at PPS or Smart Growth America or Massachusetts Smart Growth Alliance go out 
and put time and energy into it. So can we create some sort of digital crowdsourcing thing where folks upload these case studies, the success stories? It'll require a little bit of curation because we don't want this to become like the messy garage where people just sort of dump stuff in there and then it becomes not much better than the internet, right? You can go Google complete streets on the internet and come up with 42,000 hits and only a few hundred of them are actually useful. But any event, crowdsource case studies, success, and war stories. <clears throat> Let's make, and, and also as part of making the case for advocates and practitioners, what are the benefits of active transportation and place-based transportation? Um, Vancouver has done some great work on the correlation between areas and how many people bike and walk and a sense of belonging to the community and their health. Folks are looking for arguments for moving agencies away from using dwindling funds on a few big projects. Not far from me, my neighboring state is using three quarters of a billion dollars to put an interchange between I-95 and the Pennsylvania Turnpike, um, which will save folks about four minutes getting to where they're going, where for $750 million they could make every community in Pennsylvania bike friendly. What are the measures of success? Um, there's a lot out there. How do we compile them? What are, the, what are the metrics? Because as we do this kind of stuff, we need to be generating more case studies to make it easier and easier and easier for the next community to do it. And I like to talk about hard data and soft data. And the hard data is it's kind of easy. There was somebody here at Pro Walk, Pro Bike, Pro Place with automated counters. You can count the number of pedestrians and bicyclists after you do something. But how about these things that people write about? We need more information on satisfaction with their community. Do we have more of a sense of place? Increased social interaction. Another really cool idea that came out of today, and then also on Tuesday night at Pro Walk, Pro Bike, Pro Place, we had a session called Beers with Engineers, where we had six or seven of the top engineers in the country, and also advocates and stakeholders. And we facilitated a conversation, which is sort of what we did today. And folks agree that that was very valuable because everybody learns from each other. And I think we've already taken a step towards possibly implementing that because I talked to some of the folks from FHWA who were here. We hold a contract with them to run their CSS website and talked about the possibility of using some of that funding to set up these facilitated discussions perhaps at all the conferences that are already going on where people are already convening, because you don't want to use money to pay for people's travel to go gather specifically for this, but what if we tacked it on to existing conferences going on around the country? And finally, something that actually started before today through some of our phone calls with the Placemaking Leadership Council, we're, <clears throat> we're working on co-messaging at all levels, starting with the national NGOs, so for instance, Smart Growth America talks about smart growth, CNU talks about new urbanism, AARP talks about aging and community, we talk about placemaking and streets as places. Underneath it all, they're all pushing the same wagon and yet we think our customers may be confused by that and so how do we then figure out a way to talk to each other at that level so that we create a decoder ring so that people can move forward and even possibly aligning that messaging in through conferences. So that's it. Our, our sheets are over there. I think we came in second in number, number of sheets. Cynthia and I managed to generate more, I think, but uh, you know, Nate Thanks, said he'd Gary. buy me a beer if I came in second. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Clarity of message, clarity of message. It's, I, I'm hearing it again in this data idea. How do we actually make the case? So the first group, own it. The second, and, and both of you groups, prove it, tell it. I like your piece that we have to discuss it. It's not always just telling. We actually have to try to talk. Beers with engineers. I'm sure people will come up with some other little cute little rhymes. Uh, something with a Prosecco with planners. The Making Places of Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship. Who is giving the report for that happy band? Okay, then. Did you make Places of Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship? I think they're here. Oh, they're coming forward. Here they come. Innovative, creative, entrepreneurial types are heading to the stage. Hi. 
or, or perhaps people who were just uh, hanging around and then got just picked to do this job. <laughs> um, my name's Damien uh, Judici, um, and I've got my great friend here. I'm Daniel Hillhorst from Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, we thought, uh, you know, I suppose, the spirit of sort of um, what we're talking about in this space uh, was to collaborate and do it together. So um, <laughs> hopefully it can work. Um, so yeah, look, look, what we learnt was that um, innovation or this uh, I suppose the idea of making places of innovation, creativity and entrepreneurship has sort of been happening organically and now um, it's now transforming into becoming like a deliberate and uh, sometimes sophisticated um, effort to collaborate um, and I suppose collaborate with um, or an attempt to collaborate I should say with um, I suppose uh, big organisations, the creative uh, art hubs and, um, and, and I suppose um, meld them together become sort of a, an entrepreneurship that's a really long word, um, uh, sort of uh, environment, um, these hyper hubs. But they're, we're working at lots of different levels. Um, so at macro level, it's those big organisations, as I say, coming from the suburbs, coming from uh, what we traditionally we were out in the outskirts of, of the cities, uh, down to the downtown, um, and then trying to make those um, connections. Um, but similarly, the art cultural hubs, they've been um, existing and, and collaborating together as well um, in many different forms, and then even with some of the uh, responses that people gave food trucks and, and the collaboration of food trucks is an innovation in some towns and small, I'm assuming smaller places. So it's, it's an emerging space, um, but I believe, and I suppose what was sort of um, indicated to us, it's, it's significant opportunities there for um, innovation and the outcomes that can come with that. Thanks, Damien. Um, something that was really exciting about our, our workshop was the way in which people talked about existing spaces of innovation and the cool work that they're doing. Um, to give you folks some examples that came up in our discussion, uh, it, a number of different types of uh, working spaces that people talk about, whether that's a co-working space, uh, you know, a startup group, an incubator, an accelerator. Folks talked about um, just for examples to, to get your minds going, uh, there's a, a growing network of these sort of spaces in Europe, of which make a point in, uh, in Bucharest, uh, Shuttle in London, um, and, and a few others um, are all kind of working together to, to share that spirit internationally in Europe. Um, we, of course, heard from, uh, from Janet Flowers from Granville Island, and she talked about the way that people are, are working there to make that a, a really interesting innovation sort of space. Um, and I'm happy to share an example from uh, Edmonton, Alberta, where I'm from, where, where Startup Edmonton is doing some really interesting work, uh, bringing folks together, bringing ideas together. Um, but Startup Edmonton, I think, is also maybe indicative of some of the challenges that face, uh, face the way that, that innovation can be a tool for placemaking. Startup Edmonton is in the top floor of this beautiful old um, heritage warehouse building in our city. Um, in, also in the, in the building are uh, two different bars, three or four restaurants, a really beautiful um, collaborative art gallery and a pop-up uh, maker space in the basement. And so this particular hub um, does a really good job of bringing together people that are engaged, invested in their community, engaged and invested in what they're doing as practitioners and as, uh, as professionals. But something that it, it struggles with, and it sounds like a number of other um, similar spaces are struggling with, is really taking that amazing, amazing concentration that you see in this one building and really spreading it onto the street in a way that can, can make interesting and unique place and make those places more accessible. Um, something that kind of came out of our discussion is around uh, the ways in which, you know, for instance, Granville, Granville Island has a really beautiful, um, excuse me, uh, artistic community. But uh, as, as Janet said, there's not a lot of um, tech or digital innovation there. And so something that we were interested in exploring was how those two, how those fields um, could maybe maybe come more together, for instance. Damien's got another quick point. Yeah, I, I suppose we've got two, well, one, I got a point and then Daniel's gonna finish off with another point. And I suppose it's just something that uh, struck, struck a chord with myself um, was when Ed Blakely was talking about, um, I suppose one of the challenges in this space, um, I suppose the biggest job as he called it, um, was democratizing our innovation. Um, I suppose, you know, you've got these scenarios where these big organisations come down to downtown, they've come down for the proximity of all the amenity, et cetera, but they, um, they don't, I suppose, necessarily engage with the community um, or the community within that downtown. Um, and one example or one observation, I suppose, that Ed 
noticed was that um, he went into a large organisation and saw that there was one um, African American uh, in the building, or so supposedly one, um, but out on the street there was a number, and so that was kind of a little bit of a mismatch with, um, I suppose, that that collaboration or getting some degree of equity. Um, and I suppose uh, maybe it was a, I'm not sure if it was something that Ed is actually trying to um, bring into the environment or bring into this space, but he said, well, perhaps um, in, a, in a role um, of, or in the attempt to um, get some innovation and, um, and democratisation into the innovation space, perhaps uh, hospitals, which is another organisation, you've got your hospitals, your unis, you've got these large organisations, perhaps hospitals could um, give a, a job to an immigrant or uh, someone that's um, maybe not um, of the Anglo-Saxon variety or someone that's not in that traditional role in the hospital, um, a job. And that job being that they come up with the job description that they do in that job, uh, to do in that uh, environment. Um, and I suppose that really, for me, um, set my mind racing a little bit. Um, you know, hospitals are traditionally um, sterile environments, uh, sterile for good reason in terms of medical um, reasons, but they're also really quite sterile um, in a, um, a sort of a conversation or a, a collaboration, not a collaboration per se, but the engagement you have. You know, you've got your medical workers, you've got people that are sick, and then you've got, I suppose, the supporters that come into the, uh, I suppose, the family members, et cetera, who support those sick people, and that's about it. Um, you know, maybe throwing someone else into the mix um, could create a degree of empathy that isn't otherwise being talked about or, or thought about. And I thought that was just um, an interesting kind of thought bubble, perhaps. And maybe, Ed, um, if I'm going to gra grab him later and have a chat to him about that, because I thought it was really, really interesting. Damien, I think it's a good point, because um, something that came up, and I think the, the questions that we dealt with were really thoughtfully curated for kind of generating this discussion. And it's around, um, how do we make these spaces inclusive? And the answers that, we, that people came up with were all about um, were all of the things that we've talked about in terms of, of placemaking this week, making things more accessible, making it uh, available by transit, getting rid of uh, barriers, really trying to engage the community, um, and really trying to, um, really focusing on, on a true outreach engagement in the way that we've kind of talked about, the way that, that you can make um, a place. And, um, and I think something, and the last kind of question that, that kind of guided our discussion was, was what can policy do? What, what role does policy play? in helping foster these spaces. Um, and the big con conclusion from everyone that contributed was get out of the way, you know, really step back and, um, and really make, make, it ex make, make the actual spaces um, as easy as possible uh, to get into. But something that Damien and I were thinking about in particular was the fact that um, maybe not city policy, maybe not, a, maybe not a, a governance policy, but something that these individual organizations can really think about as intentional policies moving forward. Um, is to really, really think about their their purpose as being more than just in their their own spaces and their own buildings, and really to see the the need to engage with a with a broader community. So, I think that's it. Great. It's all layers. It's so interesting, isn't it? That the the themes that are coming out of each of these groups. You each have a lot of empathy with one another. Inclusion and equity exists in all of these. Innovation exists in all of these. It's tremendous. All right. Have the arts-based placemaking folks, are they here? Is Cynthia here? Or is she still upscribing? Where are you, Cynthia? You ready? OK. Art-based placemaking. Here we go. Wow. Hi, everybody. I'm Joan Vorderberg, and I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. We had an awesome session. And one of the things that I just personally observed that I thought was really great was that our panel and our speakers were equally funding funders on the foundational side and practitioners, so that was really interesting. Um, just pulled out seven uh, really key points with a lot of um, information. This uh, topic, of course, I think, and all of the topics we could talk about forever, I think evaluation can be particularly challenging. Um, so some of the points that the uh, speakers uh, discussed and some of the questions that were raised were that um, establishing what measurements are going to support the outcomes that you wish to achieve with your project is really important before you embark on your project. What is it that you want it to do? Um, and really thinking about that and being thoughtful about that. Um, it may not always be about how many people showed up, um, or as one of the speakers said, how many butts were in the seats. Um, but it may also be beneficial to measure the types of experiences that people are having and how meaningful those experiences were. And of course, that's 
sort of difficult to do. Um, knowing how many people participated in specific activities and how long can be helpful. And there was one example that was cited about like having a game checkout log and then having people check it back in. And there's some other tricky creative ways that you might be able to do that. Um, did people talk to someone new? If connectivity and, and sparking new relationships and communities coming together is something that matters in that space, then how do you measure that? And maybe those are one of the questions that you really want to know. Um, are people new to the area? Um, how did they get there? And where are they coming from? Did they bring their kids? Did they exercise? Did they spend money? Was there an increase in sales uh, at nearby retailers? Was there a redu reduction in crime um, or in real or perceived safety perceptions? Um, and then really rounding out with just saying that there's so many different ways to measure um, different activities. And of course, there's many different lenses that um, placemaking can take. Um, another point was that you should start measuring now, that baseline measurements before you begin your project are vital for knowing the intended and unintended outcomes that you might um, find with activating place. Um, and I think that there were some examples that um, uh, one of our speakers was like, had a lot of experience over many decades and that was not a priority to do baseline measurements and just being sort of regretful that not knowing the before to the after, um, that would have been really helpful. Um, that there are very creative ways to document your measurements. For example, time-lapse photography and videography are examples of ways that you can actually do counts and show how activity is happening in the area. Um, and that utilizing images and graphic design to share your data can engage funders and new audiences. Um, one of the comments that I thought was interesting was don't leave all of your data to just rest in a spreadsheet. Take it out of there, make it interesting, make it visually interesting, and consider the audience that you're trying to attract with the measurements that you're sharing. And that one size doesn't fit all, that there's going to be measurements that will benefit different scenarios. Um, so different projects may require different measurements, and if you execute those projects in different areas, that may require different measurements. So just considering all of the variables and, again, the outcomes that you're looking for, seeing if you're actually moving the needle forward in the ways that you wish to. Um, social media and digital impressions are a great and a very easy tool to utilize. However, um, various methods that don't require smartphones or technology are critical as that everybody utilizes those. Um, and being sensitive of selection bias when you're surveying. Um, it, some examples were using raffles and incentives and how useful they can be in generating participation and feedback. But the people who want something are the people who are going to be responding to that incentivization. So that becomes an unclean data in a way that um, you're really just uh, getting those participants that want to win a prize. Um, one of our speakers uh, said that one of the ways that they ensure that that doesn't happen is that they physically dis divide their space into sections and then they request one out of th every three persons to participate and they just kind of keep that as a standard. Um, and then one of the last points that was brought up that I thought was really important was who gets to decide the unit of change or who's really deciding what those outcomes are. Um, one of our speakers suggested that happiness is a really good measure uh, because if you state that you felt happy, you have your own equilibrium about what that might mean to you. Um, and so that's kind of a good question to maybe consider using in your measurements. And also involving the community to determine the unit, units of change um, that you're after is, is in many instances a, a best practice to consider. So I think we could talk about this forever and ever and I'd love to see the feedback afterwards too. Thanks. Is there something wrong with me that I like raffles? Mm -hmm. Don't you like people that want something? We, we, we had a television offered to us this week um, as a raffle, as a, as a door prize, and we had a hard time giving a television away. So I guess people don't want televisions anymore. That's what we learned in the earlier conference. Um, thanks. Wonderful syn uh, synthesis of what you came up with. And that was the most popular session by far. They were spilling out in the corridor. They didn't want chairs. They just stayed perched. Diligently. Uh, okay, let's hear from the health gang. Health. How healthy are we? Here she comes. Madam Health is coming up from the back. 
and you need a helper. Could someone help health, please? We need a health helper. Thank you, Philip. I like how the back wall is getting covered with uh, flip charts. That's uh, very productive. For those of you at home, just so you know, this has been a very productive group. Lots of flip chart paper. Here comes the health gang. So first of all, had I known there was a contest about the number of flip charts, I would have told you, Mary, you don't mess with me. <laughs> I am the winner of flip chart paper and post-it notes. Always. Okay, thank you, Philip, for helping be my easel, but I need you closer to me so I can see. Okay. So our session was a place for health, a human-scaled, community-driven approach to healthier living. Um, and I just want to give you a little bit of background because it was a room of nearly 70 people, and we had a lot of content to get through, and I am just so proud of that group and um, all the things that we accomplished today. Um, but just to give you some background, in preparation for today, the Placemaking Leadership Council former members who met in 2013 and 2014, plus new members who have been involved over the last couple months, have been on calls over you know, several conference calls, getting ourselves um, together for how we really wanted to use the time today. And one of the things that came out was you know, common language and a way to measure things. Those were like the two top things. Um, but the other thing that came out was that there's so many resources out there that so many great people are already doing. Um, and I think Gary Toth mentioned a curated database of exceptional tools, and that's something else that came up on our calls as well. So that was really um, critical. The other thing I wanted to say is there's two people in the room Anna Siprakova and Anna McKenzie, who I couldn't have handled those conference calls without the two of them helping me, so thank you for that. Um, so our agenda today was to look at um, key indicators of health through the lens of placemaking and equity and consider the social, cultural, and experiential benefits of, um, of overall well-being. My facilitators were Kathy Kostakis from um, Montana State University and Jane Ellery from Ball State University over there. So thank you to you guys. Um, so what we did was we asked people as they walked in the room to write on flip charts, which were all around the room, the, their thoughts, just to kind of get their brains moving in the, in the right direction, their thoughts on what makes a great place, what do you see as key impact of place and health, and what's your favorite measure linking place and health. And all of, I didn't summarize their answers for this report back, but all of their answers are up there on the board. Flip. We're old school in the health sector. <laughs> all right. And we're going to add these to the wall because we really want to win that prize, whatever it is. So, okay. Um, then we talked about the context and history and the outcomes of the Placemaking Leadership Council over the years. Um, and then we got to these two, these two key issues that we wanted to talk about. One was how do we define health and place through the lens of equity and inclusion? That was the common language discussion. And then we talked about measuring what matters. So, and the, the idea that came out of that was if we're going to think differently, we have to measure differently. And we, did, we were talking about, um, we don't wanna just measure things uh, based on the data that we have. We really wanna think bigger about how do we measure, how does, how does place affect health and what are the, the things that we need to measure that we're not already measuring. Um, and then we went into a group activity um, where we talked about understanding that there are already many, many tools and many good work, uh, much good work that's already being done and, and has been done before, but we wanted to brainstorm ways to think about healthy people and healthy places from today forward with this, with the, through the lens of placemaking. So this is, here's our outcomes. It's gonna be short for you. But until, until we hand you the papers from over there. This is the pithy part. Okay, a place for health next steps. We talked, to, we were thinking short term, long term, but I just threw a couple on here. There's many, many more on the back wall, and we're going to put them together um, in a document to share with the whole group. Um, tools, case studies, and research stories. Um, we talked about that with some of the other groups as well. It's the same type of thing. I'm a little closer. I wrote something in pen. Okay, healthy communities interest, interest group being started through groups like the American Planning Association, um, and it's a place to keep the conversation going. 
We talked about having a literature review of all the different measures out there um, and ways to, to incorporate them into um, our communities related to place and equity. Um, linking placemaking with the effort to end the cycle of community trauma, especially in areas with, um, in low income areas or areas with violence and drug use or, or open drug use. So one of the things that came up in that conversation was placemaking is great, but we need a place for people to move like, like safe injection sites and things like that. That came up as a conversation in the room as well. Um, we talked about getting the health in place message on advocacy, policy, and legislative, legislative agendas to have a common message so that we can bring it forth to all the different letter, levers to the people who can, all the different levels to the people who can pull the levers to make change. Um, finding a collaborative, uh, find a collaborative for communicating as professionals, advancing health in place. We talked about having a news feed related to place and health. And we also talked about healthcare providers to be involved in requiring placemaking in their um, initiative or in their um, locations. And lastly, um, the short term things that we talked about that we would do within the next 30 days one was to reignite um, hashtag place and health. So we're hoping people start tweeting that today in addition to placemaking week. Um, and we also started a Wikipedia page. There's already a Wikipedia page for placemaking, and we created a new heading called Place and Health, and we're asking all, health, all the health people in this room or, or anybody who has um, information about what health and uh, place can be to add their um, ideas on the Wikipedia page. And then the last thing is, you know, we will compile all of this information in a nice handy report so that um, Nate has an easier job. <laughs> thank you, and thank you, Philip. Great. I appreciate that people learn and communicate so differently. The groups work differently. It's fabulous to see a diversity of reporting. We've got one more to go, so own it, prove it, tell it, discuss it, share it, curate it, connect it, sell it. Let's hear from the rural people. Last group, rural. The rural revolution. They were beaten down the door to get into their session. Good afternoon. I'm going to read it like this. I'm Cynthia Nikitin, Senior Vice President with Project for Public Spaces. And um, one of the hats I wear is I run the Citizens Institute on Rural Design, which is a technical assistance program sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts for small communities, population 50,000 or less, facing a design challenge. So uh, we have a competitive award process. We also have a great website on all things rural. It's rural-design.org. So I'll just put that out there. So my, our goal is that one day the rural session will be the first to report out, <laughs> not the last, because unfortunately, rural comes last in terms of funding resources, awareness, um, the arts funders say, well, you know, creativity only happens in cities. There's no creativity or culture in rural areas. So that's the first thing. I want us to be the top of the heap, king of the hill. Okay, um, we, we started out talking about challenges and the reason we did that is because, well, we really want to talk about assets. Really to start with is what are the assets that rural communities have? That's really where the conversation should start. Not what are we missing, but what do we have that we might not be utilizing or have not recognized um, or have not um, really tapped the potential of. But we, we started with challenges. People like to get it off their chest. And they do the challenges and you put them on the wall and then you look at them in terms of opportunities and you go back two years later and say, you know, we had those challenges, cross those out. So it's not a bad place, just don't dwell on it. So you're gonna love these words, lack, loss, change, transportation, lack. Lack of funding, lack of broadband Wi-Fi, lack of public transportation, lack of local expertise, lack of resources in general. Loss, loss of population, loss of young people leaving town, um, loss of cultural or civic institutions like historic old schools or the post office that moves out of town, 
loss of jobs, loss of industri industrial sectors. You know, we've been working in Kentucky. It's like post-coal, post-coal severance. All that money's dried up. Agriculture's left, mills have left. So this loss of industrial sectors, which leads to change. Resistance to, fear thereof. Changing in demographics. We have communities that are now getting influxes of communities of color from other parts of the world that were not from there originally. Change of climate, the increase in storms, the increase in damage from storms, even flooding, um, causes tremendous amounts of loss. And rural communities are, again, um, more vulnerable in many ways. Um, attitudes, resistance to changing of attitudes, um, attitudes that are just about like, we've always done it this way and it, we don't want it to change. Um, feeling uncomfortable looking beyond their own sort of borders and their own wheelhouse and their comfort zone about what other communities are doing. Um, so this kind of like a little, and they don't get necessarily, well, get to the next one. Um, transportation, a lot of rural communities and areas are car dominated. Their state highway, is a, Main Street is a federal highway or a state highway where there's a lack of infrastructure and the distances between places, especially when it's icy and snowy um, and topography is an issue. So the sheer physical geographic distances. And another challenge is coming to an understanding of what do we mean by rural? If you go to the US, like if you Google it, like the US government has like an entire website defining rural based on different agencies, what OMB says, what USDA says, what EPA says, what any, every federal agency has a different definition of rural. And then what is urban? I like that, urban, which is that rural, urban, suburban fringe, you know, where it's kind of like, what is that? And so we were thinking about this idea of just calling it small communities. So our rural design program, we work with communities 50,000 or under. Biloxi, Mississippi has 49,500 people. Biloxi got an award. Biloxi's not real, parts of it are rural, but you wouldn't call it you know, rural like Hallam, Nebraska, that has 912 people. Um, so even amongst the rural communities, some communities self-identify as rural, but it's like, we're rural, you're not rural, anyway. So that, that even sort of that, it gets to that sense of identity also is an issue. Thank you, my dear. You're welcome, my dear. So we, then we talked about, well, what resources do rural communities need? What can the Placemaking Leadership Council um, provide? What, how do we sort of provide um, support to the work that practitioners, design professionals are doing in rural areas? And I have a whole list. You can just read it off. Um, toolkits are really helpful. Things with sample PowerPoints, how to do meeting facilitation, um, webinars, best practices, case studies, benchmarks, what's been done in other places, um, sample legislation. We didn't talk specifically about for what, um, but certainly that's, that's helpful. Um, and training, cross-sector, collaborative, professional development. Um, I live in a town in the Catskill Mountains in New York, and to be a planning commissioner in my town, you need to take four hours of planning courses. Four, four. So we have the fire chief and the butcher and you know, the guy who works at the dairy and an and attorney you know, making decisions about where to put little self-storage facilities. They had four hours of planning training. Um, but on the other hand, we also need how-tos, like delivery mechanisms. We may have a lot of tools, everyone has tools, but we don't really kind of pull them together. We don't necessarily know how to use them or how to use them effectively. Um, another one is more convenings that are rural-based, um, sort of looking at supporting this network, and there are some of these, but there's things happening in different parts of North America that we don't all know about and we should sort of understand where, where these where rural communities are coming together and how to, and how to get everyone around the table because they are hard to get to these places. Um, and network development, especially partnerships and collaboration among tiny towns that are next to each other. 
Um, maybe they're along a river or a railroad track, but they tend to sort of compete for funding because they sort of, they want their thing over here and if my thing, I don't, you're gonna take it away from me rather than saying, you know, combined, you have like 12,000 people, just work together, get over it and go to the county for money. So um, thinking more regionally um, amongst rural communities to, to, uh, for resource sharing, information sharing, service sharing. Um, and then guides to federal programs and money. There is a lot of money out there in the US government, but you would be hard pressed to figure out how to get it, how to qualify for it, how to apply for it. The, the rules change all the time. And we've been working with the White House Rural Assembly and the White House Council with all these government agencies that fund rural and they go, we don't, can't even tell you how to get the money. But we also know that the applications we're getting are not up to par. So there needs to be some training and knowledge sharing about how to help rural communities get their vision together and their planning together to be in a position to be in a pipeline uh, for, for, federal, for federal dollars. And another challenge which I did not bring up is there's a dearth of rural philanthropy. Orton Family Foundation is very good. There's some folks, the Blandin Foundation in Minnesota. Um, there's about, about a handful. The Lore Foundation, awesome, we love them. But there's really not a lot of uh, rural philanthropy out there, which is problematic. We need money, I guess, is what. <laughs> Add that money, that's the last one. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. We're going to move to the next session. I'll just summarize there. Own it, prove it, tell it, discuss it, share it, curate it, connect it, sell it, pitch it, invest in it.